Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to examine the size and distribution of cities using three different models. These models will help us understand the interdependence of cities and towns and will help us predict interactions between them. We're going to start tonight with the rank size rule, which is a model based on population size. In a model urban hierarchy, it is a pattern of settlements such that the nth largest settlement is 1 over n, the population of the largest settlement. So the rank size rule points out that there tends to be a pattern in the relationship between the population size of cities and their rank in the urban hierarchy. But it's more of a guideline than an actual rule. Basically, the size of a settlement is inversely proportional to its rank in the urban hierarchy. So for example, if the largest city is 10 million people, the second largest city in the urban hierarchy should be 5 million, or half the size of the largest, while the fifth largest settlement would be one-fifth the population of the largest, or 2 million people. And College Board does like to make you calculate settlement size using this formula. So be prepared for that. The United States, Australia, and Brazil have population distributions that closely match with the rank size rule. But generally, the rank size rule applies in more developed countries, as developing countries tend to have a primate city. A primate city is the largest city in a country that is much greater than the second largest, overwhelming the rest of the country in terms of population as well as cultural and economic importance. But primate cities are not just really big cities. It isn't just about population. They're especially influential as well. They have immense political, economic, and cultural influence within their countries. And since these cities tend to have abundant jobs with higher relative wages, this in turn can serve as a strong pull factor for internal migrants, further contributing to its primate city status. And this can present challenges for cities as they attempt to provide services for their urban population. So let's take a look at some examples. Primate cities tend to be the capital city of a country, as is the case with Mexico City, London, Paris, and Bangkok all of which are primate cities in their respective countries. But other primate cities were the capital city, often during their colonial period. Lagos in Nigeria, Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, and Jakarta in Indonesia were all colonial capitals and remain primate cities despite decisions to move the capital city to another location. But a challenge for countries with primate cities can be uneven development throughout the country, as we're about to see. So this leads us to our next model. The rank size rule established an urban hierarchy based on population size. And as cities grow in size, they become more functionally complex. They tend to have a wider range of employment opportunities and services. So our next model is the central place theory, which examines the distribution of those services. Here's our definition. Central place theory is a theory proposed by Walter Christaller that explains the distribution of services based on the fact that settlements serve as centers of market areas for services. Larger settlements are fewer and farther apart than smaller settlements and provide services for a larger number of people who are willing to travel farther. Christaller argued that cities are primarily economic centers 
whose main purpose was to distribute goods and services to the people in the surrounding area. So this is a good example of a functional region, with the node being the city at the center of a market area. The market area, or hinterland, is the area surrounding a central place from which people are attracted to use the place's goods and services. So while rank size rule gave a distribution based on population, central place theory creates a distribution based on services. The population of settlements will dictate the types of services provided and the size of the market area. The market area is influenced primarily by two factors, population and distance. Range is the maximum distance people are willing to travel to use a service, while threshold is the minimum number of people needed to support a service. So smaller settlements called hamlets in central place theory do not have very many people. Therefore, these settlements will only have services that have lower ranges and thresholds. We call these lower order services. These are going to be services like grocery stores and gas stations, barber shops and post offices. Lower order services are the ones that meet people's everyday needs. So what might be some other lower order services with lower ranges and lower thresholds? But as settlements get larger, they provide additional services. They still have the lower order services, but will have many more as the larger population can support them. But they will also have higher order services. The largest cities with the largest market areas will have specialized stores and services. These might be professional sports teams, universities, concert halls, and luxury department stores. So what else might be a higher order service with a high range and high threshold that you're probably only going to find in the largest cities? These higher order services will have higher ranges and thresholds. They need a lot of people to remain profitable, but people are willing to travel far distances to get these specialty goods and services. So let's go back to central place theory for a moment. Kristaller argued that the smallest settlements would be very numerous and situated relatively close together because they offered lower order services that didn't need many people. Larger settlements would be fewer and farther apart so as not to interfere with the thresholds of the higher order services that clustered there. So Kristaller said that the higher order settlement, the city, would be in the center, with towns evenly dispersed around it in a hexagonal pattern. Then, surrounding each town would be a series of villages evenly spaced. And you guessed it, around every village would be a series of hamlets, creating a nesting series of hexagons at least according to Kristaller's theory. But lots has changed since Kristaller's time. Advances in technology, specifically communication and transportation improvements, has made our world functionally smaller and more interconnected. Services do not need to cluster near transportation routes on the most accessible land. The internet has profoundly changed the way certain services are provided, but still, in areas where there is not a nice, neat, even distribution of settlements, services are not provided evenly either. A primate city may struggle to provide adequate services and customers may have to travel much farther than they would prefer because there are no medium-sized settlements where smaller services may be offered. But countries that follow the rank size rule may experience more convenient access to services because of the more balanced distribution of the population. 
We'll finish up tonight with the gravity model, which is a model that holds that the potential use of a service at a particular location is directly related to the number of people in a location and inversely related to the distance people must travel to reach the service. The gravity model predicts interaction, whether that is customers to a store or migrants to a particular country. And that interaction is based on two factors, the population sizes of the two places and the distance between them. So when two places are close together, there should be greater interaction. But as distance increases, interaction will decline, which is the concept of distance decay. But if two places have large populations, there should be a lot of interaction as well, even if there's a large distance between them. For example, New York and Los Angeles have lots of interaction because they're the two biggest cities in the U.S., despite the long distance between them. But this is based on traditional transportation and communication links between cities and services. More recently, communication development means that distance is less important than it once was. It doesn't matter how far the store or service is from you if you can hop on your computer and order groceries or have a telemedicine visit. So while it's important to understand these models and their foundational influences, it's also important to understand the exceptions that are changing where services are located and how they're provided. That's all for tonight, geographers. I'll see you back in class.